You want to kick us off for this one? We're going to be chatting about Conquest of Bread, chapters 10 and 11. Yep, so we're here looking at 10 and 11. So uh, he kind of covers two different topics here. He also gets very much into uh, women's rights and their say in the workplace and what type of work they should be expected to do versus uh, what type of work they should be they can be choosing to do uh, on their own accord, uh, which is you know fairly forward right. thinking of him. Uh, considering this was a quite a while ago for him to, to recognize that, you know, that there's always these assumptions about what type of work women should be doing, right, which we now we now look at as being sort of ancient ways of thinking about it. it's not really a modern view of, of just assuming that women should be doing the cooking and the house cleaning and raising of the kids and stuff like that. And he points that out and says in a in a different situation, uh, you know, where you've removed the government, you've removed capitalism, women would be able to make these kinds of choices about what what type of work they should do. And then it would actually improve things for everyone because you would have this whole whole new people in the workforce that could either, you know, decide to stay home and clean or or go out and work in a factory or whatever they wanted to do. And then he talked about uh, he talks about this idea of not everyone having to cook their own food. So instead of having 50 separate fires where 50 people need to have coal or wood or whatever to burn their fires to cook their meals at home, you could have a big, you know, like a commune. So instead of 50 different people preparing beans for the meal, you could have, you know, in one neighborhood, one one person cooks a massive amount of beans and then everyone just comes and gets a, you know, a large bowl of it and brings it home for their family. And this would greatly... Uh, reduce the amount of fuel needed for all these fires. You'd have one big fire rather than 50 tiny fires, which would, you know, you need a lot less coal or whatever it is that you're, you're using as a fuel. And it would also decrease the amount of time that was needed. So rather than having the, you know, whether it be a man or woman in 50 different households all doing this cooking, it's much quicker to just show up somewhere, get your beans, mm. come back home or whatever it is that they're all sort of sharing and, and working on it that way. So I found that kind of interesting. Yeah, what I find interesting is, so this chapter, Agreeable Work, is really, in some respects, a chapter about organization of work, right? And he, he again, is trying to link together domestic work and sort of, um, you know, what we typically think of work, work in terms of, you know, sort of production and the use of machines. In fact, he has a great quote at the very end of the chapter. He says here, quote, because those who, do, those who want to emancipate mankind have not included women in their dream of emancipation and consider it beneath their superior masculine dignity to think of those kitchen arrangements, which they have put on the shoulders of that drudge woman. And so, you know, really linking in there the idea of organization and how if we're going to talk about organizing a society, it must include liberation and emancipation for women. And if it doesn't include that, it's not real emancipation. And he uses a great example in this book specifically talking about uh, examples of communists or Jacobins who would be having conversations with uh, with their wives and they would say, well, it, who may be sort of bourgeois or something like that, but are socialists apparently saying that like, oh, well, you know, if there was a revolution, you would be eager to do the work in the same way that Jack's husband or Jack's wife does or John's uh, wife does the carpenter or the shoe or the sh shoemaker like you would be willing to do that as well clearly showing how there are large sections at least in his time of socialists who were not really thinking about domestic work and reallocating domestic labor in a way which could be emancipatory and freeing for women and he uses really great examples of that but he really kicks it off because again it's in many respects a chapter about the organization of society how do we actually organize society um, in a kind of what he thinks of as rational way. Um, and he kicks it off by talking about factories and how factories can be made more clean and more healthy for individuals. So he has a great line right at the beginning of chapter 10. He says here, quote, it's the start of the second paragraph. He says, it is evident that a factory could be made as healthy and as pleasant as a scientific laboratory. And it is no less evident that it would be advantageous to make it so. In a spacious and well-ventilated -ventil factory, the work is better. It is easy to introduce small uh, ameliorations and of each would and excuse me of which each would represent 
an economy of time and of manual labor. And so the idea being there that if you increase the well-being for individuals in the factory, that it seemingly will automatically increase the efficiency as well, right? So if you make it more spacious, you make it more well-ventilated, you know, you give workers what they need, it automatically means that society is going to get more pleasant and that the output is going to increase as well. So in other words, if we want to talk about the organization of society, we have to be talking about the organization of society for the workers as well. And that's a really important angle to put on it. Now, there are a few questions that I'm going to raise in a few minutes um, about how he's particularly framing it, uh, but I think that that's, an, that that's a valuable way to think about it um, at the very least. I don't know. What do you think? I, I think you also gain in this idea where, you know, if people are happy at work, they're going to do better work. I mean, I, I've really worked some rubbish jobs growing up that I'm glad I will hopefully never have to go and work anything like that again. But, it, you know, c circumstances that are unpleasant and not unpleasant in the way this is, I, you know, where it's like run down unhealthy factories and stuff like that. But just having that work be a drudge and you, you don't really want to be there. It's dark. It's, you know, maybe damp. It's an unpleasant workplace. People are just not going. If you don't enjoy being there, you're not going to mm -hmm. do as as good a work. So this idea that if you let workers decide how the factory should work, they will create it in a way that they are, you know, they want to come to work and do the kind of work that they want to do and that they can make those kind of choices. I'm, I remember working some kind of these, these terrible jobs. And a lot of times you would have rules handed down from the top that were ridiculous. They didn't even make sense for the business, but someone had decided, here's what we're going to do. And it actually gets in the way of you doing the good work that you want to do. You're just running around like following these rules instead of just all my effort is going into producing whatever our factory needs to produce for the day, getting that work done. And then we can all go home and, you know, stream or whatever it is that, that we're going to do right. at the end of the day. So, um, you know, this idea, I, I think there's value in this idea of letting workers have a say in the workplace rather than just handing it down in this this hierarchy. I, I think there's benefits to that. Right. And I do agree with that, certainly. Um, I mean, he even says so much. He says, nevertheless, now and again, this is the start of the third paragraph. Nevertheless, now and again, we find we already find even now some factories so well managed that it would be a real pleasure to work in them if the work it well be understood were not to last more than four or five hours a day and if everyone had the possibility of varying it according to his taste uh today we would add her taste as well and so you know it's really i think a good way to think about the issue of organization and to think about the uh issues of efficiency right like Think about efficiency and think about organization in favor of the workers. Now, where I think he maybe starts to run into trouble is that he seems to assume later into the chapter that anytime you do this or that whenever you maximize the efficiency or well-being for others, you're, or excuse me, whenever you maximize well-being for the individuals in the factories, you are maximizing organization and that therefore you're going to be increasing their labor. I think maybe, but like I think that we should try to disentangle the efficiency angle of it from the moral angle of it. Like, yeah, you should have a moral obligation and just make a moral case for why workers should, you know, have control of the means of productions make a moral case for why workers are able to organize their factories and why uh you know this is going to be good for the workers but some maybe disentangling it a little bit from the um, efficiency case might be good because i'm sure there probably are some examples where actually it's cheaper and more efficient to just put up nets over the apple factory as opposed to you know providing them better pay and health care etc cetera, etc cetera, um you know so that they don't commit suicide um and i wouldn't want our argument to then hinge on some kind of scientific claim about morality. But let me get into why I think that he's saying this, um, and maybe I'm just interpreting it wrong, um, but I think that it is sort of in line with some of the other things that he's said earlier in the book. But anyway, um, so he's giving this example of how he was touring a factory for, I believe it was the creation of some kind of metal or something of the sort, and he's talking about how beautiful it was. It was as well swept, like the bricks were you know, super well swept. Uh, everything was very clean. The gardens were well tended around the factory. It was beautiful and large. There was glass ceilings in parts of the factory. And then when he's starting to ask questions about the efficiency and why it wasn't so loud, he and uh, you know why it why uh, why it wasn't so hot and sweaty for the workers. He says here, uh, and, and again, he, this is him on a sort of tour um, with the manager of the factory. He says, "Well, it's a mere question of economy. This machine and that plain steel has been in." Uh, 
this machine, that plain steel, has been in use for 42 years. It would not have lasted 10 years if the parts had been badly, uh, uh, badly adjusted and interfered and creaked and cracked at every movement of the plane. And the blast furnace, he asks? Well, it would be a waste to let the heat escape uh, instead of utilizing it. Why roast the founders and the workers when heat is lost by radiation represents tons of coal. The stampers that made the building shake five leagues off were also a waste. It is not better. Is it not better to forge by pressure than by impact? And it costs less. Uh, there is less loss. And so basically, he's arguing that it's a much cleaner, much more efficient way to organize production by, uh, you know, making it so that the heat isn't getting escaped by making it quieter, because, you know, whenever there's loud noises, it means that the parts aren't well adjusted. And so you make the parts well adjusted, it turns out by incidents, that's making it more efficient. But by incidents, it's also making it quieter, which is much more pleasant for the worker. And so I think that there's an interesting kind of connection, which he's drawing here between um, sort of rational rational organization, where again, he's defining organization as the maximization of well-being for the individuals in the workplace, and kind of a moral maximization as well, um, which isn't quite maybe as argued for. And we did see similar echoes of this earlier in the book at the very beginning when he was talking about issues of pseudoscience and how the development of pseudosciences and economics would undermine our own moral standing by making us, be, you know, sort of lying in order to self-justify a system. He argues that we're the kind of people who rationalize our situations. And so if we have an irrational system, he argued earlier in the book, it means that we're going to be forced to lie in order to sort of in, in develop pseudosciences in order to self-justify the economy. And that that makes us, by dint of just having an irrational society, makes us less moral people. And so I think that there's a kind of interesting correlation about how he's thinking about morality in this book. Um, I mean, again, I think that he's making a, um, a really good case for making workplaces better. But I think that he might be doing a little bit more maybe than he really can with the arguments that he's giving us. Maybe I'm wrong, though. Uh, there definitely, I would say in these two chapters, I would say his writing is not maybe as tight as it has been in the previous chapters. I mean, he's he's starting to give examples here, but it's I feel like it's he definitely didn't fill every case. He didn't fill every hole that's, you know, every possible thing that someone could object to. I think that there are I think what he's trying to do here is to give counters to the the immediate questions or responses that people give that would be uh, knocks against this kind of a system. Uh, but I, yeah, I mean, I, as to his idea of efficiency, I guess I'm, I'm just the type of an individual when it comes to work, I, I do think that efficiency, or at least for me in general, does lead to better work because efficiency effectively involves loss, right? You have some type of loss that you didn't gain from. And so any of that loss along the way means I have to work longer or I have to work harder in order to make up for that inefficiency for that loss. So I think it would, I, I guess I see his argument that inefficiency does degrade the workplace, which then mm -hmm. degrades you know, the work that we're doing overall. Now it might be a, a bit of a stretch to say that kind of, that's enough to make the whole argument that he's trying to make, but I think it's maybe definitely a brick in the argument, um, you know, that needs yeah. to be set forth in, in order to make this case. Right. I agree. I mean, the thing is, like, he's not necessarily making a case argument, which would require some kind of, like, inductive set of, you know, like, this post like, or like this case, that case, and that other case. He's not really making a case argument. He seems to be making a deductive case. So I think that... Um, Holes could be particularly damning. I, I don't know, maybe. Uh, but anyway, so he's linking this idea of organization into women um, and how when we talk about the organization of society, we have to be talking about the organization of domestic labor as well. Um, otherwise, again, you know, the quote that I'm reading earlier, well, we've just left out half of society and that's uh, that's really, really bad. In fact, he concludes um, he, he concludes this chapter um, with a quote here saying, um, only let us fully understand that a revolution intoxicated with the beautiful words liberty, equality, solidarity would not be a revolution if it maintained slavery at home. Half of humanity subjected to the slavery of, of the hearth would still have to rebel against the other half. And so you haven't had a revolution unless you've liberated women, unless you've provided emancipation for women. And the specific sort of emancipation which he's envisioning for women is the emancipation from household labor. And the way that he thinks that this emancipation could occur is through some kind of scientific development um, and machines which could make labor easier for women, first of all, and second of all, through a reorganization of how we sort of live together. So he gives examples of how you could have um, 
basically like sort of housemaids kind of come through and uh, and they wouldn't have to be women, of course, obviously. But like, you know, you'd have workers come through and uh, prepare your breakfast. You'd have workers come through and clean your bed sheets. You'd have workers come through and possibly clean your, clean your chimneys, shine your shoes and all of that kind of household work. And they do it for, you know, maybe a block of houses. And, uh, you know, you'd throw your shoes in the bin and then they'd come back tomorrow. They'd provide you breakfast because he argues that it's, you know, just a really big waste to have, uh, you know, like a ton of different fires being lit. In order right. to produce food for all of these different homes, maybe you should just centralize that and, uh, you know, come t and basically, um, you know, be able to choose between um, having meals in common and between having meals by yourself. Because, he, you know, he gives this interesting example of how, like, solitary confinement is bad because you are only you are forced to be alone. But then prisons are bad because you're forced to always be together. And so you're never being able to give solace. And so the balance or the proper life, he argues, is the, is one in which we can choose when to be alone and when not to be alone, when to be able to find, um, you know, time to yourself and solitude and when to be able to socialize that we need both and that we need to be able to choose either way. And if we can't choose that, then we're not free, he seems to think. And that, that, that really is like a very linchpin understanding for him of what it means to be free, the, the ability to choose socialization. He criticizes the Christian approach a little bit, um, the Christian approach being that, uh, you know, you'd come and have your meals in common. This is, of course, the history of the Eucharist, where um, the, the Eucharist being, uh, you know, sort of what today a lot of Protestants will call communion, right? Um, and uh, having meals in common, and that when we share the meal in common as Christians, you'd say, well, you're eating the body of Christ and drinking the blood of Christ. And um, there's actually some really interesting Roman literature, like describing early communion meals and just thinking like, what the heck are these people doing? Um, but anyway, like he, he says that like, you know, this is forcing us to always have meals in common and that this is maybe not the best way to go about it. So he seems to have some interesting, uh, interesting ideas about meals. Uh, but he thinks that this is all very deeply tied up with, um, with women and liberating women. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I think the 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 like I mentioned earlier, I, I'm super uh, impressed that for the time that he was in, that he was able to stand up for women and and recognize that there was definitely an, an inequity and inequality going on there that needed to be addressed, and that he you know he put it in his work. He wasn't afraid to put it in there for backlash or something like that. Um, you know, he put it in there and went with it. And the the idea of community, you know, I guess like this case or the uh, the discussion we're having about how well he kind of proves his case. I guess it, it makes me think back to earlier in the book when he mentioned that, you know, he, he kind of said that we don't have a perfect prescription for how everything would work. I feel like he's kind of giving examples that are counter examples to objections that people would bring, but he's not necessarily saying this is the blueprint for how we have to do everything. He's just saying this is mm -hmm. one possibility of how this could come about. Um, you know, especially how individualistic we are in the United States. I, I I don't know that all of these would come into play. I don't know that we'd have a neighborhood, you know, someone cooking for the whole neighborhood and then you would come get your food or you'd have a couple houses each cooking some stuff for the neighborhood. I don't know well, if that would really fly, well, but it's a possibility of, of ways we could achieve things because I think it's back to this efficiency of you know, if we can find all these different ways to eliminate the inefficiencies we have in society, suddenly we find ourselves with all this different time because this this argument at first seems a little unbelievable. I know at first I was a little taken aback when he's like, yeah, we can get away with only working a few hours a day, five days a week. It's like, what? But then when you start noticing all these inefficiencies that we could remove, uh, you know, we all have the different fuel for our fires and we all have, you know, all this different stuff. You go, oh, actually, we could greatly reduce my needs, which means if we're all trying to meet the society's needs and we've all lowered our needs, but we're still getting those needs met, like we've, uh, sorry, we have the same needs, but we've reduced the amount of effort it takes to reach those needs because we're more efficient, then yeah, logically, it seems like we would get to a, a better place that way. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting, again, like he's linking in the, the importance of organization with the ability to emancipate people, right? So he thinks that it's just, again, irrational to have all these fires burning around the house, uh, you know, and, and he talks about how it's such a waste of time to have what he says is one tenth of the European population shining shoes, right? That this is just like a complete waste, right? You should have, uh, you should maximize efficiency by just sort of um, 
I guess, um, delegating resource or delegating the tax to a few people and then have them just, you know, basically be that like the only thing that they sort of do. Um, and that he seems to think that this is, again, like really tied in with the liberation and emancipation of women. What I find really interesting, though, is that he's really relying on technology in many ways to liberate women. So he uses an example, for instance, of this dishwasher machine, what today we would call a dishwasher. He says it was invented by uh, some woman, Miss Crocrane. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. Solved it with this machine that allows you to put 12 dishes or 12 plates or dishes into the into this machine and apparently wipes them and then dries them in under three minutes uh, my dishwasher does not go within three minutes but uh, right. I am I suppose able to put in more than three dishes now I will say uh, about this is it's interesting right because he seems to think that you know you put in these technologies and then as a result of that women will be truly free to go about and, and do what they want what I find interesting about that is there actually has been some interesting writings about um, about how women were like uh, you know given accorded more and more respect over time. It's still a project, obviously, that we're working on. Um, but some social, some feminist sociologists are starting to think that it was, it actually was the it, bringing in technologies into the household, which allowed women to go out and get a job. They didn't have to spend as much time. And, you know, I mean, that makes you wonder, like, what, you know, what really came first? Was it less sexism that allowed, you know, like, I mean, there's a kind of, I suppose, chicken and the egg thing. Um, but he does give a really example, a really good example here. Um, I'm, I'm not sure where the quote is exactly, uh, but he basically says, uh, I don't know if you have it, Chris, but he basically says uh, that, like, it's not sufficient to talk about women emancipation if we're all if by that we only mean giving them access to the law courts we only mean giving them access to jobs and workplace we also have to emancipate them from the work that they have to do in the household. Um, I'm not quite sure where that where that quote is. Um, right in front of me but it's you know it's a really great and interesting quote about how he's thinking about emancipation now obviously he is he uses the word only like he is saying specifically that uh yeah we need to obviously make sure that women have access to the law courts that women are equal under the law but that he is also really focusing on the work angle of it the making sure that women are not being you know demanded of that they have to handle the domestic labor as well um, on top of things and that this isn't just like a patriarchy where all of the free labor time is just going to be absorbed by men. It has to be shared in equal between men and women. Um, so again, I think, you know, Chris, you're really right that he's focusing in on this when a number of socialists at the time, as he criticizes in this text, um, were not thinking about this. And I think that this is um, certainly a, a, a mark to his credit. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. So you want to move on to chapter 11 or were there more points that uh, you I think wanted to that make? wraps up uh, chapter 10 pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I will say uh, he also talks about like the ability of electricity and electric. This is still in chapter 10 electricity and electric light. How this is also going to like um, really help um, help women as well, because they'll be able to like, I guess, you know, they won't have to be cleaning. I guess the lights, I, I don't know enough about how like old gas lights work. So I'd, he's, he says that like, they'd have to clean them. I, I don't know, but uh, I guess that's how they used to work. So um, it's interesting that like he sees these things as so deeply tied up with women's liberation. Whereas today, I don't think that any history textbook would use like the example of lighting as examples of, you know, women sort of being, I don't know the word that, that you would use, but like, I, I find it interesting that this is, this sort of prognostication is very different than the than the retroactive history that that I suppose we read. Oftentimes, Chris, like when I was reading about the women's movement, like in school, we would focus on like the marches and how they were given the right to vote and how, for instance, like women were given jobs during the world wars and, you know, they like prove themselves. I always found that like a bit of a bizarre example, but that was mm -hmm. how my history class taught me. You know, it was like, oh, look at all these women who went to go to you know work during world war one or during the civil war and that this like really afford them respect and it like proved that they could do in you know i'd always found that was a bit bizarre but anyway i suppose that like the history that i was taught was very different than some of the stuff that feminist scholars are coming out with now and as well as uh what kropotkin is saying in the book as well so i don't know yeah it's interesting yeah yeah it is um so on to a chapter 11 chris do you have any like sort of main things to say about chapter 11 or uh yeah, so this chapter, this was kind of a longer chapter, and the second half, he's just kind of giving a lot of examples, which um, 
are interesting to look at, but I don't know that by themselves they definitely like completely make the point that he's trying to make. Um, but they are, they are interesting. So this is the one. Let me catch my place here. Free agreement. So this is where. Um, you know, he's basically talking about the state and should the state be involved and can you organize without the state? If you don't have the state, they're kind of putting things together and making sure that there's there's some sort of organization that things will start to fall apart. So he makes a number of cases that you can really do incredible things without the state coming through and making these decisions. And one of the arguments he gives is this massive railroad system where uh, he... By, by his example, he's essentially saying that this was just put together through self-organization. You had small groups that were working together in order to make this railroad uh, be successful and that you don't need a state stepping in. Um, and sometimes when you do, like he gives an example, I think it was uh, from Russia or something, where he talks about uh, the, the government making a decision about a railroad, but it was hugely uh, resource intensive. Right, because they said, "Oh, instead of taking this uh, circ circuitous route, we're just going to draw a straight line and just go straight from A to B." But you had to like fill in ravines and all sorts of stuff. So a huge amount of effort being put forth into satisfying the government. This person at the top, who just you know, it was very easy for him to just draw this line and say, "Do it this way, everybody." Mm -hmm. And then you know, the whole nation kind of had to throw whatever resources were necessary into getting that job done and that maybe if you have groups working together right. uh, you still can get the job done but maybe even in a better way and certainly uh, you know back to the efficiency argument probably with a better degree of efficiency at least compared to the cases that he gave now he was choosing these cases seems to be kind of cases on the extreme he picked one extreme which seemed unreasonable with the level of resources that it took and then comparing it to where we had some sort of self-organization going on, but uh, I think I, I think he does, you know, maybe not prove the entire case, but he he makes a point here that self-organization I think can go further than we necessarily assume that it can. Yeah, so I mean, he really kicks off this story again. It, it's about free agreement. He's arguing that free agreement is superior to the state, which he cut, kind of uh, sort of conflates with unfree agreement that you know you're forced to do things. And going to the railroad example, I mean, I'll have more to say about it um, in a few minutes. But I, I think you're right to point out how you know Kropotkin is saying, well, look, if you have people on the ground making the decisions, you know, actual workers who would know, they would have more information about what would be required in order to do this, that, or the other thing. You know, you have governments who are supposed to be like kind of jack-of-all-trades or politicians or kind of, you know, the jack-of-all-trades supposedly, like a good one, who knows a little bit about everything and that that makes kind of, a, I, I suppose, a good politician, that they're not really going to know all the information on the ground. Um, but let so, sort of going through the chapter. Um, so he kicks it off really interesting with just a typical example here is that we're basically accustomed by training and how we were raised up to think that, quote, we would have to become or that we would have come to be believe that men would tear themselves and tear their fellow men to pieces like wild beasts the day that the police took their eyes off them. And so, you know, the idea being, of course, uh, I think that we still see this very often today that, you know, if police officers were to stop patrolling communities, oftentimes minority communities, well, what that, of course, would automatically mean is that uh, police officers or, or that, you know, the community would just immediately descend into violence and descend into chaos. He doesn't seem to think that that would be the case. And he goes into examples of how we're sort of and, and to sort of justify this conclusion, he uses examples, and I, th I found this quite interesting, how, you know, our entire life we're focused on the actions of government as if the actions of government, or I should say the actions of the state, and how the actions of the state are conflated with the actions of a people or an actions of a nation. So he talks about how newspapers are entirely, consu entirely consume themselves with political jobbery, what he calls political jobbery, and that, you know, if you are coming from another world, if you're an alien, we've been seeing some interesting UFO videos and stuff like that coming out. But if an alien were to read our newspapers, they would think that nothing happens in all of Europe except for stock exchange transactions. And that, quote, nothing gets done except for by save, uh, save by the order of some master. And so, you know, that that's the only way that we can organize ourselves and that this is really misleading. He talks about how in newspapers, things will only ever be mentioned, no matter how important, if police have appeared on the scene. And so the entire way that we think about our society, the way that we think about our own organization, 
is through the government, through the in- lens of the state. And, I, you know, Chris, I found that really interesting because, you know, I've, I've been thinking for a while about the kinds of videos that I make, the kinds of videos that you make. And, you know, I, one of the things that was so interesting about Andrew Yang's campaign, I you know, look, I supported Bernie Sanders throughout the primary. But one of the things that was interesting about Andrew Yang's campaign is that he was bringing issues which were political issues. They were political questions that had an audience to them about issues of AI, but were not considered, you know, serious political questions that are dealt with in Washington. Issues of AI, issues of competition resulting from AI and things like this, that these are things that are political. They are political 100 percent, not any less political than, you know, issues of tax credits and the like, but that the government traditionally hasn't been handling it. And so they're seen as less serious. They're seen as not politicized debates. They're not seen as like, you know, the serious list of issues which politicians are supposed to care about. Um, And I don't know, like, I, I find this interesting. Like, how I, I don't know, Chris, like, how do we think about this problem? Because I think that he is right here, um, at least partially. What do you think? To say, sorry, can you just re- yeah, like, like, sh- like, summarize the yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, question? Like, he is right in a certain sense to think that, uh, you know, we focus too much on the actions of government and assume that the mm-hmm. actions of the state or the actions of government are political news. That anything that happens in government, mm-hmm. well, that's politics. But things that happen in free enterprise, things that happen in, happens in the church, that these things are not politics. But in a certain sense, they are. And, and they might be just as much, if not more, political than the things that happen in, in, in the state. So we end up in a situation where news is anything that is considered mm. to be the limits of the state's domain. Right. And so we might end up having a very skewed, misrepresentative view of what's going on in society, what's going on in our nation and in our, you know, in, in our community, indeed, if we just conflate news with what the government or you know, things that involve the state actually do, and that we might have a very distorted view of the world if we think about if we you know doing political commentary as we do on our channels um maybe we're just completely doing it wrong maybe yeah like we need to sort of encompass everything together i mean you were kind of making an <clears throat> before we were we were going you were talking about how kropotkin is making the case that the the capitalists and the government are sort of uh you know very similar and we i feel like we see that in today's society like where did the banks end and the government's pick up, right? Where do the, the oil companies end and McConnell starts? Like, the, you know, all these individuals, it's like, it's pretty hard to define that defining line between the capitalists and the government in, in this day and age. And and there's even a quote in here where he talks about, um, you know, they forgot to prove to us that it is possible to put an end to exploitation while the primal causes, private capital and poverty, two thirds of which are artificially created by the state, continue to exist. So he's kind of making that same argument there where all these things are related. And I think it doesn't help the way we treat this two party system in this country where you feel like you're on one team and you're always looking to kind of prove the other team is wrong and that your team is right. And it it keeps us like you were saying with the news where, um, you know, you sort of view the news through this this uh, this lens of you know, is that part of the government? If, if it's a politician that says something you don't like, then that becomes newsworthy. But we may be missing the fact that, you know, Bezos is getting very, very rich while his workers are are still in that poverty uh, type situation, right. and, which is very much politics. I right. Think. And these things are just as much news and just as much politics as are things that go on in the government. And even, you know, sort of right. extends this argument by talking about how we think about history. He's, he talks about how our histories are only histories of parliament, our sort of bourgeois histories. But then if we try to make any any historian who tries to make a history about actual social life and things that are going on in the day to day, that their work is ultimately neglected. Now, fortunately, that has uh, changed to some extent since Kropotkin's time. There has been a lot of real real effort in, in, in history to avoid kind of only doing sort of bourgeois and nationalist histories. Um, a lot of lots of histories now will focus specifically in on people groups and people groups in specific time periods. So there has been a lot of change in that regard. But I think he is right to talk about how our entire lens of social life is really f- angled in a way which forces us to think that government and the state is the only way to organize our social life. And certainly, like, I agree, right? Like, the state is a relatively new invention. You can literally read the lines in Hobbes and Tom, the work of Thomas Hobbes where he invents the concept of the state, and then the state ended up being enacted a few decades later, right, in, in England for the first time. Like, the concept of the state. Not the government, but the state as such. Um, and so, you know, it, there's certainly many different ways to organize um, organize our social lives and organize the way that we, you know, sort of think about uh, – think about the world. And I think that he's right to talk about, or at least um, conjecture for us, 
that um, it's reasonable for him to conjecture for us that, uh, you know, we entirely conceptualize the like the way that we conceptualize the entire world, the way that we think about news is entirely through this angle of the limits of the state's action. If the state domain doesn't extend to this or that thing, well, then it's not really news. You know, it might be it might be gossip. It might belong in a tabloid, but it's not serious news. Serious news is the limit of the state's domain. Right. Um, and so right. I think that that's like an interesting approach to thinking about the world. And I think that that provides for us a lesson to think um, for ourselves and how we can develop our own potentials. Um, so I found that to be valuable in this chapter, at least. Um, yeah. And another connection that he draws between the state and the uh, and basically capital, you know, th so thus, if a company ruins its competitors by cheap fares, it is often enabled to do so because it is reimbursed by land given it to given to it by the state for gratuity. And, and we see this now in our own system where some, you know, some companies that are very profitable, they they get huge tax breaks and stuff for, you know, for certain projects. Like we saw the telcos get hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks for building out these networks that we can all have cell phones for. And yet, yet we still, you know, we don't get to share in those profits. We helped build the network with our tax dollars. The state gave them basically a big tax break, but we don't see the benefits of that, right? It just allowed this company right. to get well, really, Well, but even, really even, there, even there, though, like the reason why it's news is because the state was involved in, involved in it, right? Because the state right. did some kind of tax break. Well, well, then it's serious news. Well, what about the things that are, the state was not involved in? What about the, I mean, isn't it just as much, I think Kropotkin would suggest, or at least conjecture to us, isn't it just as much a question of the state where the state was not involved? Because the question is, well, why wasn't the state involved, right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, oftentimes, you know, we'll get mad at something well you know there should be regulation here well what kind of a claim is that what kind of a claim is that right it's a claim about it's a claim about the state and so there is a certain sense um perhaps in which you can't ever escape the state's domain in a world in which the state does exist so it's either a question of should the state be there right. or should the state not be there in a certain way i mean there's obviously nuances to to approach it but i don't know it's kind of interesting now he moves in a little bit um and this is where i I start to wonder what he's up to here because he talks about here. Um, I'll just read this quote here. He says, we therefore propose to point out to some, uh, some of these striking manif manifestations and show how men and, or today we would add women as soon as their interests do not absolutely clash will now act in con in concert harmoniously and perform collective work of a very complex nature. Now, the thing about that, that I want to ask is, well, what are the things which makes it so that our interests don't, clash i mean he doesn't really tell us he seems to he, he suggests that the state prevents our interest from working in harmony um but i'm not like he doesn't necessarily make that argument there it seems like that's the central argument because the defenders of the state the defenders of government will argue well the purpose of the government is to align interests with one another when interests clash the role of the state should be to come together. This is the argument of sort of the pro-state. Um, they would say, well, the the role of the state, the role of the government would be then to to balance out, um, to balance things out, right? Like you either levy a tax, you you know have some kind of fine, so that then interests can work in harmony together, and they can you know cho come together through free agreement and. Um, move 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 things forward there's other conceptions of the state certainly right because that conception of the state would be that the purpose of the state is to maximize free enterprise right um but that seems to be the dominant view of the state under neoliberal capitalism right um but that would be the that would be the approach that a neoliberal would respond to kropotkin and he doesn't have an argument to that and that would at least today is the main argument for the state um so i i would like to have seen more complicated arguments from Kropotkin, which really deal with the substance of it. Because, you know, he goes on here and he says, and I'm just going to read this paragraph here. Um, it's a sort of short paragraph here, but uh, just to show an example here, he says, but what concerns us is not to give examples which might be blindly followed and which moreover present society uh, and, and moreover, which present society could not possibly give us, what we are, what what we have to do is to show that, in spite of the authoritarian individualism which stifles us, there remains in our lives, taken as a whole, a very great part in which we only act by free agreement, and that therefore, it would be much easier than is usually thought to dispense with the government. I'm not sure that that quite follows, right? Because he's saying that, well, if what we do is we show examples of how in our life we can still, 
right? We can still, uh, you know, we still have free agreement. It follows that it's easy to dispense with the government. Um, but that doesn't argue, that doesn't respond to the objection that the government's role is to make sure that uh, uh, people people's interests don't clash. I don't know. Like, it seems like he's missing um, a really big part of it here. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I think Kropotkin is kind of, maybe painted himself in a corner. I mean, his approach throughout this book seems to be he, he's a very all or nothing kind of a guy because um, if you if you kind of take half measures, then those half measures seem to get corrupted one way or another, right? If you try to control capital, capital is going to find a way around that, which we see today, right? We put regulations on the banks and they find some other way, some other workaround, right? It was, what, 20 years ago, it was Enron. Then they did that, you know, then we kind of fixed that stuff. Then they found another way to, you know, to crash the housing economy. They're always finding different ways of these workarounds. So the, uh, the answer then is to eliminate the capitalists. And it's the same thing with the state. I mean, it, you know, we have lots of examples throughout history of the state uh, acting not in the people's best interest. And, and it could be argued that there, we've, we can see states where they are not aligning interests. They are sort of creating their own new interests that they want to follow uh, being corrupted. So I think he I think he takes that same approach. Well, if we take a half measure to government, it's just going to work itself back in, you know, to that corrupted territory. So the answer then is to eliminate it, is to essentially do without it completely. And then we'll just kind of get by on our own. Right. So so I, I think that's kind of his approach that he has to take, which is obviously a very sort of uh, hard line to take, which is, you know, it's all or nothing. There's no there's no kind of compromise in the middle. But that sort of seems to be his style of of doing those things. Yeah. And, you know, what's interesting is he's giving us examples here um, about the railroad. Right. So that's kind of what he really focuses in on. And I will say, you know, if you ever go to law school, um, be prepared to read a lot of texts about railroads or any kind of class in law just you're going to read railroads 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 or even you know you pick up a textbook in law which is kind of, kind of what, what i did i picked up a textbook in law and basically it's like a bunch of stuff about railroads because railroad law gives is, is a paradigm example for a lot of other cases um and they were very you know there was a lot of money involved at the time and this is when legal systems were especially in america were really coming into being to help think about issues of capital and think about these things and so railroad is like i think a really smart example but now his case though is interesting right because he's giving us an example as chris mentioned earlier he's talking about how you know all these railroads came together and they had all these free free agreements and the like the thing though is we also need to remember this very concept with which Kropotkin is hailing only a few decades after Kropotkin's death morphed into the colon, the European coal and steel, steel community. In other words, they needed to have the state involved in order to regulate and maximize efficiency together so that they could compete with the United States, right? You had, what was it? Italy, France, Belgium, Luxembourg. Um, there was six countries. I can't remember um, to, to start with. Um, and that those countries came together and form the basis of what then later became the U European Union. Um, but so I find it interesting that like the very example which Kropotkin uses to show why we don't need the state, it ended up being just a few decades later, um, ended up needing the state in order to compete with the United States um, in order to sort of maximize efficiency, in order to maximize um, maximize like they were having all kinds of issues with trading and, and, and the like, and that that was the only way that they were going to be able to compete with the United States. So. I find that interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a complicated thing that you, you know, you want the state to be in there in order to al align these interests like we've talked about. But sometimes that's sort of not what the the state is actually actually doing. So it's uh, trying to trying to sort of structure this this uh, idea I'm trying to say. So um yeah, I'll just leave it at that then. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, yeah, no, <laughs> I, 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 I just I like, like it's just interesting, right? Like he gives like really compelling examples and sort of thought experiments in theory about how, you know, we don't need the state in order to, you know, maximize efficiency when it comes to railroad development and the like. But at the end of the day, the very example that he used ended up requiring the state in order to develop this community in order to compete with the United States.
Now, the reason why the United States was able to produce coal and st was able to produce steel so efficiently was because it was one state. It didn't have all the different borders. It didn't have to deal with the different laws. So I suppose Kropotkin does have a kind of response, right? Um, but the only way that Europe was going to be able to compete with a, a, a something like the United States really was to come together and to stop having, you know, uh, basically like uh, uh, simplify and formalize, have one legal set to deal with, you know, all these different transnational uh, stuff with steel and, and coal. And again, it ended up morphing into the European Union because they were like, wow, we can compete with the United States on steel. Let's try all these other products. Um, and then they developed the European Union, Union and they're like, oh, wow, well, let's try to, you know, have one single currency, and, you know, and there right. ended up being problems there. Um, but, you know, like it, it's interesting to me how Kropotkin's very example kind of fell in on itself a little bit if, you know, you add a couple decades to it. Um, but again, I mean, he has he has interesting examples for how, you know, in the United States, he talks about how I think it was, was it the Vanderbilts or something that like um, sometimes they'll, you know, they'll have trains go on, you know, extra, you know, like long routes, basically, so that then the Vanderbilts could get a little bit of money. They'll like, um, right. I don't know right. enough about that historical example, so I can't comment on it, but that's interesting that apparently that happened, right? That, uh, you know, you'd have trains going through and then they just go on a random detour so that then the Vanderbilts can get a little bit of money. I, again, I don't know anything about that historical example, so I'm not sure how that happened or what what were the con what was the context of that, but that's certainly interesting. Um, and I wonder if stuff like that still happens today, certainly. Um, right. Of course. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that's how the decisions get made now. Does it make some capitalist money? Yep. OK, then we're going to go ahead right. and do it. And I would think there would be a bit of a rebuttal here to the comparison of the train system in Europe versus the United States, because I think you could you could probably write an entire book about how the train system. Obviously, the train system was pivotal in the country for helping the country get a boost and increase itself sort of economically. And yet look at the amount of suffering and um, inequality and all of these things that are also connected to the trains in the United States, right? The abuse of many of the workers who were essentially treated like slaves, very unhealthy situations, people dying, right? If you were the one unlucky enough to be picked to go put the dynamite in, then you probably had about a week left before you accidentally blew yourself up and they replaced you with someone else. I mean, horrible situations that you would, you know, you could make that argument well, that American system it served the purpose of putting those trains down, but it made a lot of it made some people very, very rich yeah. at the cost. Well, it also, of the well, that, of well, well, that also happened in Europe, though. Like, it's not like that didn't happen in Europe as well. It, it was different from my understanding because you had different countries enacting it differently. So the laws were different in each country. But but I think theoretically, if you were doing this under a under a society where it was people sort of deciding together how to organize, how to build the train. Oh, certainly. Right. Seems to me like you like the way he's, you know, sort of in his utopia, you wouldn't have people saying, OK, this this certain one job, people only last about a week in it before they blow up. But that's right. just that the just, price of getting happen. a train made. You, you hopefully right. would have a little bit more. Uh, consideration for fellow humans as you do this right it wouldn't happen and Kropotkin would would say that well then you're gonna obviously have like a much more efficient train system because of that um, that's you know I suppose an empirical question right I don't know that we have a hypothetical counter example but right like I mean it obviously seems like uh, you know capitalism doesn't take into account the fact that people died blowing themselves up making right like how do you how do you put a utilitarian calculus on that and would you right. want to use utilitarian calculus to calculate something like that? Is it the case that utilitarianism tells us anything meaningful about morality? It seems to put the cart before the horse in many ways, right? Right. Um, so then he also has some interesting examples about the Red Cross. He has interesting examples about the uh, Lifeboat Association, something that we met earlier in the book, um, talking about how lifeboats are constructed to uh, save people um, and that this is an entirely voluntary association, that it's run largely through donations, and that, uh, you know, this is basically an anarchist society. This is a favorite example of his. I've read numerous things talking about how Kropotkin, in basically all of his writings, talks about the, the, the Lifeboat Association and how this is, like, amazing, and that this is, like, sort of his pinnacle example of how an anarchist society could work. Um, and I find that interesting. I find that interesting. It's a good example. I don't know that it really tells us that like an entire society could work this way, right? Right. Like, it, it it's interesting. Um, 
but yeah and he talks about for instance the modesty of the lifeboat association that they don't um they don't actually they're so modest that they don't they, they withhold their votes the the workers of the lifeboat association will withhold their votes on matters which which involve the lifeboat association um out of a kind of modesty whereas you know he says that like state politicians they would never do something like this which is true certainly um so I, I don't know. I don't know how analogous this is or what, what like this really tells us. What do you think, Chris? Like how, how successful is he here? Yeah, I mean, I think they're good examples of people uh, or good examples of, yeah, yeah, people coming together and being able to achieve uh, really great what things. What we would think of as being, what was that? I would say really great things, achieving really yeah, great really things. Yeah, really great things and things that you at first might think are too complicated to achieve without a hierarchical hierarchical system that you might go, oh, well, you, we got to put someone in charge and then everyone below them has to has to answer to the person above them and, and this whole system. And, and, and I, I think it is interesting to point out, you don't necessarily need that. You have people that are going to step up and do things that many of us might consider undesirable, but you're going to have people who step up and say, no, this is my calling. I have to do this kind of Red Cross job or, or I, I think it's important. I'm going to go help organize how the votes work. Um, I do one thing that I do think about throughout the book, and I kind of hoped he was going to address, but I feel like maybe hasn't been addressed to the level that I would like to see. And it doesn't look like maybe it's going to maybe it, I don't see how it would fit into any of these chapters. What happens when someone just says, you know, forget the rest of you. I'm taking my boat to the front of the line. I mean, he, he does mention in here that if you do that, if you try to cut in line, you're now out of the group. Mm -hmm. Right. But, um, you know, you got to figure there's going to be people that still try to do that kind of stuff. And I don't know. I'm not convinced that in every situation, not not being part of the group is going to be enough of a disadvantage. I mean, it seems like it does in this boat group where they're all uh, is this the same one or is it a different group where the, um, you know, people are ordering how the boats are going to come in and how long you can stay docked before you have to leave and go back, take your ship out. So make room for someone else. And it seems like in this situation, it works. But I, I feel like we could find situations where not, you know, sort of being exiled from a group, if the group isn't big enough, then maybe being exiled from a group isn't enough of a threat. And you could sort of go and try right. to impose your will and there wouldn't be enough of a counterweight against that. I think most people would actually act pretty good in this situation. I think the vast majority of people would be good faith actors in a situation like this. But I do think, you you know, you've got, you know, what one percent of the population are you know psychopaths and stuff you know are going to operate differently right right yeah i mean it's really it's really difficult because again he goes back again like what he says at the beginning there is that when our interests do not clash we work well in, in accord and harmony together and i agree with that when your interests don't clash we work well together just fine and when our interests in fact align then we work really 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 well together um, but the, the, I think it sort of begs the question, well, what situations create for having aligned interests? How do we align our interests with one another? Um, and that's a question which Kropotkin just seems to think that would sort of work itself out through free agreement, that through free agreement, we would work out our, our best interest and that this would kind of just work. I really wish that he would give a more robust answer to this he closes this chapter here he closes chapter 11 with the lines here and yet the facts we have quoted only give us a glimpse a glimpse of what free agreement has in store for us in the future when there will be no state but again i mean the argument for the state is has always been at least the neoliberal state right the asterisk there the neoliberal state has always been that the role of the state is to bring interest into accord with one another you either tax some uh, some group you put fines you you know whatever you have to do in order you know you you whip their hands or whatever and wh whatever you have to do in order to bring interest into a line so that you can have the most efficient capitalist society that's the ar that's the argument for state neoliberalism right and he doesn't really respond to that objection and oftentimes what the reasons why these free associations popped up is because of state failure in the case of like why wasn't the state or the government involved in like making sure that their own cargo could get to shore safely so then you had people in lifeboats rescuing people um you know when their ships would start to sink right so it seems like and also the other example that he uses is the red cross where you know you have wars because of states um and so it seems to me that these free associations are popping up in areas of state failure does it follow then that um, once you get rid of the state, 
that these associations, A, would still exist, and B, that there would just be more of them. I wish he would argue for that. He hasn't argued right. for that, at least as of yet. Maybe future into the book, you know, we still got this much more to go, so maybe further into the book he'll give us those arguments. But as of yet, you know, if we're going to give an honest commentary of where the book is so far, he's told us this, but he hasn't argued for it. Um, yeah, and I think it was uh, it was a good point you made earlier about the distinction where we're talking specifically about the state, because when you when you hear other people talk about you know this type of of government that Kropotkin is arguing for, you still would have these sort of groups of organizations, right? You'd have these communes or whatever where you have people making decisions. You still have something going on. You just wouldn't have this giant uh, overseeing right. the state. That is sort of uh, you know imposing its will. It would be much more of a equal type situation where you're much closer to having your the the will of the people right being carried out because you have you have a and much much the, smaller local government right and bringing the interest into accord. But what happens when right. two communes have conflicting right. agreements, um, c conflicting uh, interests? So it's interesting. We'll have to see how this plays. Anything else to add to this uh, this section today, Chris? Or uh, I guess the only it? thing I would add is that, the, like you were talking about efficiency earlier, and it seems like sometimes now efficiency is used to actually do things that would be harmful to people. So we see, you know, big companies get bought, dismantled, tens of thousands of people lose their jobs, all in the name of, oh, no, we're not doing anything wrong. We're just making these companies more efficient. Right. We, we're going to break them up, sell them off for pieces, and we're making it all more efficient for people. So that same efficiency argument can be used the other way around, which is not to the benefit of, of people. So I guess it's a it's kind of a careful con. You have to be careful with that concept a little bit because it can actually be used, you know, against the, the good of the people. or well, the, the Kropotkin, people. well, Kropotkin would say that, like, if you had true efficiency, that then the interest would come into align in a certain sense like you're right in the capitalist system but what do they mean by efficiency they mean maximize profit for income spent so right. um you know it seems like it's a he kropotkin would say well you have a perverted concept of efficiency and that that's why once you have a total a totalizing concept of efficiency then interest will accord with one another and that they're going to come into harmony um and so far, at least, it seems like that's a bit of hand waving to me, at least. Maybe I'm misunderstanding mm -hmm. it, uh, but I haven't seen the argument for it yet. So, um, anyway, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's this section of the book. Also, I will say he hasn't talked much about the environment and how we bring and make sure that people have, uh, you know, if we're just talking about maximizing efficiency and well-being, like how do we make sure that we're not polluting too much? Uh, maybe that's something that uh, you know he didn't really think about because of when the book was written, but. Uh, that right. would be something we'd have to consider today. So anyway, thanks guys so much for joining us and uh, hanging out with us for uh, for the book club, the Peter Kropotkin book club. Next time around, I think we're maybe just going to look at chapter 12. It's a pretty long chapter. Um, okay. And I, if we linked it in with chapter 13, I think it would maybe be a bit unbearable, even if only chapter 12 is maybe slightly short. But if we did both thir 12 and 13, it would probably be too much. So next time sure. around, we'll just look at chapter 12, chapter 12 of the Conquest of Bread for next week. We're going to be live again Wednesday at 730 Eastern, 430 Pacific. Thanks so much for joining us, guys.